Professor David Bamford to his second talk. Now we go to infinite dimensions and uh, let's see how he can survive there. <laughs> and uh, I wish to really uh, express my appreciation for your presence here today with uh, difficulties of weather, rain. It's a great audience. So, Professor Manford. Yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, having sat through the first talk, which uh, might have been you know, a little disorganized in some respects. So I tried to make this one. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. But uh, it'll be more mathematical and not uh, so much applied math. Um, so, uh, and I'm quite happy if, if you uh, interrupt me, too. I know it's a big audience, but you know, if, you've, if I'm really missing some point I should explain, I'd be glad to, to do that. Uh, so I, I thought I might just recap where we are. Uh, so starting with applications, uh, we found many situations in which an optimal warping of one uh, phase or MRI, or uh, in the last case it was a map, uh, to another was, was called for. So this warp, mathematically a diffeomorphism, uh, to be optimal, uh, <clears throat> we interpreted this to mean that it was smallest, the, the, uh, the diffeomorphism, measured by a geodesic distance uh, of that. Uh, so you would put a Riemannian metric on the space, the big infinite dimensional group of all diffeomorphisms. Uh, and then that gives us a, a distance between, say, the identity and another warp. Uh, and uh, we use that to say how big the, the warping is. And having a measure of this kind in applications is very useful. Uh, then the point of the previous talk was that really these warps were easier to deal with. Uh, it was much more elementary mathematics if you deal with them in terms of the, uh, their effect on finite sets of landmark points. And in the applications, uh, substituting for a full shape and a full diffeomorphism uh, a finite set uh, of characteristic points on the objects or in the image uh, is, is an is a old uh, idea. Uh, and so we then uh, proposed to put uh, the, the quotient Riemannian metric on the space uh, of these sets of points uh, by using these minimum norm extensions to vector fields on the whole of the space. Now, this lecture, we're going to put aside applications. And we asked the question, uh, what uh, kind of geometry uh, do we have now on this finite dimensional space, but more particularly on the infinite dimensional spaces like this diffeomorphism group? What is the geometry uh, which we're dealing with here? Uh, so I want to quote this. Uh, th this was a complete surprise to me until Peter Mikor told me. But in this very famous lecture of, of Riemann, where he, introduced the, he introduces the whole idea of manifolds, he introduces the idea of Riemannian manifolds, he introduces the idea of curvature. It's a fantastic paper. Uh, uh, but in any case, it's not so well known, I think, that uh, two-thirds of the way through this paper, the following appears. Uh, there are, however, manifolds in which the fixing of position requires not a finite number but either an infinite series or a continuous manifold of determinations of quantity. In other words, your coordinates could, be an, could either have an infinite set of coordinates or the coordinate might be a function in a vector space itself. So uh, <coughs> such manifolds, and this is so fantastic, are constituted, by, for example, by the possible shapes of a figure in space. So he anticipated this entire development, which was not picked up uh, for 150 years. Um, now, the point of this lecture is uh, to recapitulate what happened to me. Uh, n n most people uh, who have studied math are very familiar with Banach spaces, Hilbert spaces. They're familiar with linear infinite dimensions. That's a, uh, and, and you have things like Fourier series going back and forth between sequence spaces and, and uh, periodic functions and so on. But uh, but nonlinear infinite dimensional spaces uh, are uh, a much more, uh, a much less known field. And uh, what happened to me in studying this for the last uh, 10 years or so is I've been absolutely astonished at the diversity 
of geometries which you encounter with extremely natural metrics. So you take a really elementary space, such as simple closed plane curves, and you find that uh, there is this tremendous variety of different metrics you can put on this space which give it very different sorts of geometry. So the idea of this talk is really that I think there are uh, paradigmatic examples, exa examples you know, like um, Brownian motion for stochastic processes, which sort of define a little bit the parameters of, of what you're going to encounter. And so I want to talk uh, about some of these. So this is kind of a lot, and I may have to skip uh, <coughs> radically towards the end. Uh, I start with a few general points, but then I'm going to, there are really four categories of, of, of spaces. There are these spaces that curl up, as in string theory, where we have these <laughs> tightly curled up dimensions in our universe, according to string theorists. Uh, but if you have infinite dimensions that can curl up I infinitely tightly and you can have conjugate points dense on a geodesic, you get I interesting phenomena. So I get, uh, and then there are some cases where really beautiful classical things like spheres and Grassmannians of infinite dimension appear. Then there is this unbelievably beautiful example of the universal Teichmuller space, which is, is uh, to my knowledge, is a unique instance of, uh, and I'll describe its properties a little bit later. And then I want to get back to diff and what I like to call its Chow quotients, the, the, the uh, well, I'll define this in the next transparency. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so what, what, what are the uh, manifolds that we want to look at? Uh, well, I won't look at all these, but just these are the ones that have been um, uh, discussed in, in the literature. So suppose you start with a finite dimensional M, compact, for instance, if you want, or non-compact is okay for many, many situations. Okay, so we have the diffeomorphism group. Then we can also look at the set of immersions of an N and M. So these are both readily coordinatized, uh, so I lump them together. But then we have the, the set of sub-manifolds of some topological type. As <coughs> in Marcus's talk uh, yesterday, uh, looking at um, surfaces, genus one or higher. Uh, so now this is harder to coordinatize uh, and, to, and to deal with. Uh, to, but uh, the case where this is S1 and this is the plane, uh, is I'm going to talk about in, in examples, the first three examples. You can also look at currents. This has been used um, in, uh, in applications a great deal. Currents have, uh, are very uh, helpful in many situations. Uh, one that's been studied in the literature quite a bit are the set of probability measures on the space. So the so-called Monge kantorovich metric has been studied extensively. And of course, the space of Riemannian metrics on N, where of course um, we have the, all the <coughs> the, the uh, beautiful metrics that uh, come from Perelman's finding the ideal metric on every three-dimensional manifold. Okay, so in any case, th this is sort of the territory. Um, and um, okay, now in all these cases, the, the question arises, uh, how smooth uh, should the sub-manifolds be or the diffeomorphisms be or probability measures? Uh, which means the, the charts on these manifolds, the, what, where should they lie? The, the charts on infinite dimensional manifold should lie in an infinite dimensional topological vector space. Uh, and there's a beautiful book of Kriegel and Michor, uh, which argues uh, strongly that you should at least start your investigation by using C infinity structures. And they, they call this the convenient calculus because you never run into trouble doing your um, all the calculations you'd like to do. But of course, they're going to be incomplete uh, if you use such a, a, a small, uh, such smooth objects. So if you have a Riemannian metric here, uh, the natural thing to do is to complete them, say, in pathwise distance in, in that, uh, with the Riemannian structure. Uh, and you can hope you get a Hilbert manifold, but you don't. <laughs> That's really aggravating. You always get something you can call a topological Hilbert manifold. It has charts in a Hilbert space, uh, but, the, but the coordinate change charts are in general not differentiable. And it comes from the nasty fact that if you take, for instance, a smooth 
diffeomorphism here, and you look at the mapping associating the inverse to that diffeomorphism, that is not a differentiable map uh, with respect to sub f norms. Uh, it's because the derivative of an inverse mapping has the uh, derivatives of the original function in the denominator, and, and so you lose a derivative, and it's not sub f differentiable um, in, the, in the strict sense. Anyway, that's, I'm not, it, I just, it's a little caution that Hilbert manifolds in the strong sense are rare uh, in this game. All right, now let me talk about the type A manifolds. So these, so I, for abstract properties, they'll be highly positive cur uh, curved. Uh, the GDS equation would be a hyper, can be a hyperbolic PDE. Now, a hyperbolic PDE, nonlinear, of course, uh, it ha generally has a nice uh, initial value problem, uh, but often it, uh, the, uh, when you integrate nonlinear hyperbolic equation, it hits singularities. Uh, so the exponential map you can expect to be, oh, wrong one. To, uh, uh, to be locally good, but the conjugate points on a geodesic are, are likely to be dense. So what happens is the infimum of path lengths is zero, and the path length metric totally collapses. So let me describe the simple case of this, and you'll see what, how it goes. So, oh, damn, I hit the wrong button. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to take simple closed plane curves, and I'm going to use the L2 metric. Now, what is the L2 metric? Uh, so if we have that curve given by the solid uh, lines here, and we take the perpendicular hairs sticking out of it, then a nearby curve will intersect uh, them in a point, and so the nearby curve uh, will be given by a scalar function times the unit normal, uh, uh, infinitesimally or within a local neighborhood. So we'll get to all nearby curves by just adding a function A of S on the curve times the normal uh, vector <coughs> field. Uh, so, so that gives a parameterization of the nearby curves uh, by a space of linear functions. So that's a coordinate chart. Now, interpreting it uh, infinitesimally, this is an infinitesimal deformation, uh, then we just take the L2 norm with respect to uh, arc length, and that's what I mean by the L2 metric. So it's the simplest conceivable Riemannian metric you could put on simple closed plane curves. Well, so I was merrily studying this about 10 years ago. Uh, and I kept trying to, I thought, I'd, oh, okay, let's do a computer simulation and find out what geodesics look like. <laughs> the damn thing never worked. I got all sorts of screwy things were happening. It finally dawned on me, uh, it doesn't work. Well, actually, I'll skip ahead. It doesn't work. Uh, th this is the secret to the thing. Uh, the problem is, if I'm going to move this curve to this curve, let's say I'm going to move upwards, this will be part of an uh, original curve, and this will be part of a new curve, and I'm just going to move this upwards. Suppose instead of moving it upwards by a set of straight lines, you grow teeth like this until you touch this, and then you shrink the teeth up here. The claim is this has much shorter length than going straight up. And the reason is quite simple. There's a cosine factor in here. Uh, you see, what we did was we took the normal. We, we measured distances by looking at the normal distance that you move. Now, if here uh, you take the normals to these, uh, then those are going to be much shorter. If we're moving at unit speed up here, the, the, the normal component will go down back uh, be multiplied by one over uh, multiplied by a cosine factor. Uh, so a squared goes down by a square of a cosine. The length goes up by the cos one over the cosine. The net in point then is that the integral goes down. So uh, I mean it's kind of like this idea. I think sharks are supposed to have the, uh, like teeth in their skin, and uh, something to do with how they can move fast. I guess that's a boundary layer thing. But in any case, it's uh, let's go back. Um, but geodesics do exist. Uh, if, if I go forwards instead, say I start with a straight line like this, and I put a little blip here as my initial condition, the initial velocity, the geodesic looks like this. Now notice what's happening here. It's, it's acquiring infinite curvature at two points there. So the, the forward equation can be integrated, but not globally. 
Now, what's that equation look like? This is sort of amusing. The forward equation looks like this. Now, that doesn't look like a hyperbolic second-order equation, but you have to remember that A is really the first derivative of the family of curves. So this is saying that the second derivative of the family of curves is a quadratic expression in the first derivatives. And that's what geodesic equations always look like. The second derivative is a quadratic expression in the first derivatives. Uh, but it's highly nonlinear. Uh, well, but it has a coefficient here, making it uh, see. <laughs> so now the, the point is that the curvature of the curve itself is, is a second spatial derivative. So if I write the curve as something like y equals a function of x and time, then this would be a second derivative in x, this would be a second derivative in time, and so it's a hyperbolic equation. <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but it, it really is it's a hyperbolic equation. So it's a really nice, simple, it's kind of like the, the famous heat equation for simplifying curves, except it's higher order, second order instead of first order, but it, the curvature comes in just like it does in, in the, the so-called geometric heat equation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty curve, a pretty equation, I think. Uh, here's the uh, conjugate points. So, uh, okay, so my, my, uh, <coughs> the point is, we'll see in the next slide, positive sectional curvatures, uh, and they get larger and larger with higher frequencies. Uh, so you can always get faster by adding higher frequencies. So now the set of concentric circles is, for symmetry reasons, it's got to be a geodesic, and it is. But I can actually go from this one to this one, where the radius will increase by a factor of 1.9, and have a little pentagonal perturbation, and this, uh, and then that will come back to the circle again. So these curves is actually that's actually a geodesic, and it's giving you showing you the two geodesics from here to here. Uh, so it's a conjugate point. So it's kind of pretty. You can really get your hands on in these things. Now, curvature. Let me remind you, uh, curvature, uh, sectional curvature is what I'm dealing with. It, given a two-plane inside the tangent, if it, so I have any Riemannian manifold M, any manifold, and I have a two-plane inside its tangent space, then there is going to be a curvature associated with that two-plane, which, which is the curvature of the surface inside M of the geodesics, uh, which you get by exponentiating W. Now, if, if W has an orthonormal basis AB, uh, you find that R of W is a quadratic form in the wedge of A and B. So it's a, it's a funny kind of fourth order tensor, uh, and it's this, the Riemannian curvature tensor. And it's normally given by a rather messy formula in the first and second derivatives. But it turns out with this particular metric, uh, again, this is such a beautiful metric, it has this tremendously simple formula. It's the square of the Ronskian. If you have two, so I, I have to start with a, a curve and two changes in that curve, two infinitesimal motions of the curve, and they're given by scalar functions a and b, and I just take the Ronskian of a and b, integrate, square it and integrate with respect to arc length, it's obviously non-negative, and that's the sectional curvature. And you can immediately see that if the derivatives get higher, for instance, fix A and let B have higher and higher uh, fluctuations in it, higher frequencies, uh, this is going to go to infinity. Uh, so you can see immediately why you get this, this clustering of, of these uh, conjugate points. So uh, yeah, let's see. So uh, w one thing I, I mean, I, I like to tr try to do is to get a sense of the geometry of what's going on. So this was a little experiment. There's an easy fix to make the metric not collapse, which is to replace this the metric with these two by throwing in this factor, which says that if, the, if you go through things with high curvature, uh, the length is penalized. It, it's, it's longer. And, and th th this fixes it, and now there really is a nice path length metric, and you can so. Uh, but this has the effect that if shapes are large, uh, the curvature becomes positive. If shapes are small, the curvature becomes negative. Well, so I said, all right, let's take three ellipses rotated 120 degrees, and they form a triangle. And I can make the ellipses small, medium, or large. Uh, and, the, and these are the geodesics. If, if the 
if the ellipses are small, uh, the geodesics uh, look pretty much like ellipses in here, but they're, they actually sort of lose their eccentricity and they come closer to a, to a circle. So it, this, this turned out to have curvature, uh, the sum of the angles was 102 degrees for that, that one. So that's negative curvature. And out here, you see you get from this ellipse to that by a completely different path. This one sort of rotated and shrunk the eccentricity as it went. This one says, what the heck, I'm going to grow another set of bulges and slowly shrink these bulges. So uh, it's more like going from, uh, from here to here. Instead of going back to where you came with the circle, it sort of goes, goes out. And then it's, it's almost like a square in a sense. But uh, anyway, that one had 207 degrees. So uh, and here's another thing. Uh, uh, if you use that metric here, uh, which, which uh, penalizes um, high curvature uh, uh, and has then negative curvature, what happens is the following interesting phenomenon. If you, I, this is actually it was just a random curve I drew by uh, Fourier expansion of a few terms. And this is another random curve. And I said, what happens if I try to move this curve to this curve by translating? What's the geodesic? Well, it turned out they all formed a sort of a cigar. Uh, and you can prove that. And it's because in negatively curved space, uh, if two things are, are, if you have a whole set of things over in one part of the space and a whole set of things over here, and you look at the geodesics, they all essentially form the same path in the middle. The, the, the geodesics in a negatively curved space all come together in the middle if you're going from a set of points here to a set of points here. Well, that's what's happening here. You see, everyone takes the same highway is, is the idea of uh, the rallying cry for negative curvature. And th this is the highway. It's moving this little cigar. Anyway, that was kind of fun. It's just a, oh, and here's another example. Diffeomorphisms of S1 under the L2 metric also has, is just like plain, um, simple closed plane curves. So this is, this is a, oh, sorry. This is an illustration of why the L2 metric on, uh, uh, well, on any Rn, uh, you have infimum path lengths is zero. But this is one dimension. So these are points uh, in a one dimensional axis. And this is time. And what happens is in the initial time and the end time, you see these points have been moved upwards. Up here moved upwards a little bit. Up here moved upwards a little bit. In the middle moved upwards a lot. And the way you do that with very small energy is you form a shock wave and have the particles move through slightly faster than the motion of the shock wave itself. And you work out the, uh, the energy of this, and it turns out to go to zero if the shock wave gets more and more singular. Uh, so anyway, it was um, it's interesting to, well, that's another example of a space of this type. OK, so now I want to move to the second case where a, a miracle occurs where you start with objects which you have no idea that they're, they're going to be simple to describe, but it turns out that they have a very nice classical description with a positively curved space of bounded curvature. Uh, so this is the, the simplest example is, is the probability uh, measures on any space M. Um, and what, what metric do you take? I mean, there's, uh, we don't take the Mange Cantor. We take this metric. So if, if mu is a, is a probability measure and we perturb it a little bit, that means you add a, a, a metric rho, of a measure rho, whose integral is 0. So it remains a probability measure. Uh, then you say the size of this tangent vector should be the integral over m of rho squared over mu. You see, this is a measure squared over a measure. It's a measure. Uh, a mu has to be, uh, I did say, everywhere positive. Um, uh, and this is a, the natural L2 metric on probability uh, uh, spaces. Well, this is a, oh, huh? this is amazing. This is a sphere. <laughs> it doesn't you mightn't guess that, but it's a sphere actually. Um, why you choose your a base point in this uh, in the set of measures, and you do the following: you associate to uh, to any measure the function, which is the square root of the derivative of mu with respect to mu naught. Now notice that if you, if you square this uh, like that, 
and you multiply by mu naught and divide by mu naught. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you square it and you get mu over mu naught, and now you multiply by mu naught and you get the uh, <coughs> uh, you get mu uh, whose integral is one. So so these these are all on the unit sphere uh, in this Hilbert space. They're in the positive octant of that unit sphere. Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the standard distance uh, on a sphere worked out for this case. Uh, and it's a small calculation to show that infinitesimally this reduces to this. So, um, so that's really, uh, th this doesn't seem to be well known in, in probability books, but it's, uh, it's the simplest example of such a space. So it's clearly constant positive curvature. But the, the, I want to discuss a, a, another example at greater length, um, which is uh, discovered by uh, Laurent Younes. Um, and it goes like this. Uh, we're going to start uh, with functions, uh, V being uh, the Hilbert space of functions from the reals to the reals, which are uh, negatively periodic. Th that's in order to make the index of one of the things we're going to create. Uh, and we're going to take the Grassmannian of two-dimensional subspaces inside here. Now, what we're going to show is that this Grassmannian uh, is, uh, is exactly the same as the immersions of a circle in the complex plane, mod translation, scaling, and rotations. And the mapping is very simple. You take f plus i g. Uh, oh, sorry. We take a basis of the two-dimensional plane here, f and g. And you square f plus ig, and you integrate, you take the indefinite integral, uh, and that gives you uh, the, cur the parameterized curve at the point theta. Uh, and uh, the one half is, in order to make this an isometry, uh, so the beautiful thing here is that this is, um, the Grassmannian has a standard uh, metric on it. Uh, and what you put on the immersions is something like, I call it's an H1 metric. So you take, if you have a perturbation uh, of phi, which I call delta phi, you take the arc length derivative of that and square it and integrate it. So that's an H1 metric. But I say infinity is because you don't have any term involving uh, delta phi itself. Um, uh, now I skip over. The proof that this is true is, is simple, but uh, let's not, I don't think we should run through this. Uh, now this is, yeah, so this is, a, this is really cute because we have here uh, a, um, you know, a really simple classical space. And we know what geodesics are on, the, on Grassmannians. Um, and so we can, uh, <laughs> we can really go to town with seeing what happens. And so this is a, uh, I thought, let's look at a nice, simple case. So there are lots of closed geodesics, so, but you, you're going to go outside the uh, embedded curves. You're going to go through immersions, and then you're even going to not be immersion sometimes. So you start with a circle, and you begin perturbing it into an, an elliptical way. But then what happens is it lengthens faster and begins its squashing there until this happens. And then it passes through itself and gets this immersed curve. Then the, the little blips at the end shrink and shrink and shrink until at this point, it's not an immersion at two points here and here. And they pass through the other side. They go out. They, <coughs> they pass through each other. And then this is the antipodal curve <laughs> to the circle. And then it just continues, and it actually reverses itself. And you've got a beautiful closed geodesic. Uh, yeah, I thought it's really pretty. Um, OK. Uh, then, but you really, uh, emergence are not so interesting. It's much more interesting to have uh, emergence modular reparameterization, which, uh, which are actually the, the, the curves in the plane, um, including the, the simple closed plane curves. Uh, but you, you, can do, you can divide out by, the, uh, by this extra group, which ha happens to act by uh, isometries uh, here. And so you actually get a, a Riemannian submersion. So, I mean, I used the word submersion last time. It, it just means that this has sort of the quotient metric of the, of the given metric on this. So, it, so it's a quotient metric. And it's an, it's an old fact uh, from uh, O'Neill that quotient spaces have 
uh, have more positive curvature than the original space. Uh, so this actually, uh, this space now has, is even more positive, uh, but it's still not, uh, uh, it's still bounded nicely. So uh, now the metric, now the metric comes out in this funny way. You see, we had the normal deformation of the curve, but uh, we, if we're going to take a derivative, we have to look at an unknown tangential component, take the derivative of that, square it and integrate it, and then take the minimum over, over the tangential component. That's the natural metric. OK. Uh, and this is just the formula for what geodesics are. So I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, and here's some examples. Uh, uh, you remember the rotations were divided out. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if you take, yeah, so if you want to go from the, I guess it's a cat, I'm not sure, to a camel, uh, it can choose what orientation it wants to, to pick. So you get from the cat to the camel uh, by m matching the, the head to the forefoot and the tail to the head. Uh, but you can see these, um, uh, you know, what the heck has happened here? Oh, I guess these, oh, I see, yeah. Oh, this became the two, these two feet, right. Anyway, it's kind of interesting to, to see how, how it, uh, it does these things. So he's got the pigeon going to a bow tie. Uh, is here determined by some initial deformation of the first curve? No, no, this, these are determined by uh, the two endpoints. This is the, this is, it's a minimizing geodesic. And so you have to solve for the right, right reparameterization, and you do that by dynamic programming. Yeah, it's it's a, it's not a it's a little tricky to implement, but it, it, uh, I mean, you, the geodesics are so totally explicit. All you really have to to figure out is what the right reparameterization is, and then uh, you can check. So, all right. Uh, okay, so that, yeah, I think that's okay. So now let me let me go on to. Um, uh, these, uh, this really wonderful example. So, uh, of course, this goes back, uh, you know, uh, more than 50 years, actually, to, to the original work of Alfors and Bears, and then Kirillov, and uh, more recently, um, Dr. John and, and Guy Balmaz, who just wrote his thesis a few years ago, proved marvelous existence theorems. Um, as we'll see, this metric is, is a very challenging one for existence theorems because its, it's sub-left weight uh, is right on the threshold. Uh, in any case, uh, so what, is, what are the properties that the space has? Okay, it has everywhere negative sectional curvatures, but they're not large. The, the marvelous thing is that the Ricci curvature is finite. This is really extraordinary for an infinite-dimensional space. So to so remind you, you have, let's say, a geodesic going this way. You look at all the orthogonal directions, uh, and for each orthogonal direction, so perturb it this way or this way, you look at the sectional curvature in this two-dimensional plane. And we add those sectional curvatures up over an orthonormal basis of the orthogonal directions in the tangent space, and that's the Ricci curvature. So that's just a symmetric quadratic form. Uh, and, but you're adding up an infinite number of higher and higher frequency perturbations in these two planes. And the miracle is that it's finite. It's not, and actually it's not merely finite, it's a multiple of the actual uh, uh, metric tensor. Uh, so it's an Einstein space. But it, it's even better. It has complex structure on it. It's even better than that. It's homogeneous. There's a, there's a, it has a transitive group of actions on it. I mean, so I, my, it's my candidate for the nearest thing to Euclidean space in infinite dimensional geometry, well, outside of uh, topological vector spaces. Because, because look, it's got a group acting on it, it's homogeneous, it's really flat in higher frequencies. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, it, it's kind of extraordinary. Uh, but it's a metric, on, oh, I didn't say, it's a metric on simple closed plane curves mod translations and scaling. So I'll, I'll, that's in the next slide. So, Okay, now what do we know? We know that the geodesic equation is an integral differential equation, uh, has a globally defined exponential map, and unique geodesics joining any two points. Okay, so it's the nicest space you could ever dream about. Now, how do you get it? So let, let me do the construction uh, step by step here. Um, 
So, uh, so this, is, of course, brings in all the machinery of complex analysis. We start with the Riemann mapping. Uh, so, for, so now uh, we deal with the complex plane. Um, and R is a, um, the interior of a simple closed curve. Uh, so it's a t homeomorphic to a disk. OK, so there's a unique conformal map of the unit disk to R. Which, sorry, unique up to uh, a simple uh, set of uh, transformations of the disk. Uh, but now, here's, here's the marvelous idea. Uh, let's, uh, let's do this twice, both to the inside and the outside. So this is the Riemann mapping for the inside of the, of the curve. And this is the exterior, uh, the exterior in the plane plus the point infinity, which is another disk. Uh, that uh, is conformally equivalent to the complex plane. Uh, oh, what have I done here? Oh, sorry. This was the curve, the exterior of the curve. This is the exterior of the disk. Um, and so uh, we get the exterior mapping. But the exterior mapping can be normalized by requiring infinity to go to infinity and by asking that the derivative of infinity be a positive real. So that exterior map is really unique. The interior map is not unique. But the upshot is that we can, uh, we can, for, we can go out from the disk by the interior map and back to the disk by the exterior map if we are on the circle itself. So on the, unit, the circle being the common boundary, uh, w uh, w this, so long as the, as the curve is decently smooth, the Riemann mapping extends to the boundary, and um, uh, we have its boundary values of phi zero and the boundary values of phi infinity. So here's an example. Suppose the curve is simply an ellipse. This is a diagram of the Riemann mapping of the interior in the sense that we take the obvious of radial lines and concentric circles in the unit disk, and these are their images under the Riemann mapping to the ellipse. And this is the same thing for the exterior. And what you see is that the interior mapping has very high derivative along here. It whips along fast and very small derivative here. So if you do this construction, this is now a mapping of the circle to the circle. You see, this is because we started z was on the circle, and this is again on the circle. And so here's the, here's the graph of the mapping. This uh, high derivative are these two points, and this slow derivative are these two points. Uh, here's, let's see. Oh, no, never mind that. Uh, OK, so now here's, here's a more complicated example. And you, you, you can see that, uh, so here we have this cat. Uh, and the, the derivatives are highest at the, at the ears, and also where the tail its rear end is curled up. Uh, yeah, and you get, and you get quite a complex little uh, curve for this thing we've been calling the fingerprint, um, uh, for want of a better name, uh, of the shape. Why call it the fingerprint? Because you can recover. Uh, the beautiful thing is you can recover this curve from this mapping. That's this observation, which I think was due to Kirillov, or maybe Alpha was in Bears, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, and that's called welding. And it goes like this. Uh, suppose you have a diffeomorphism of the circle. You take two copies uh, here of a, of a half sphere, delta plus, delta minus, and you weld them by this mapping. Now, welding actually works in complex analysis because of the wonders of complex derivatives and all. Uh, it, it actually, the unique conformal coordinates even across the weld. So this, the result is a compact Riemann surface. And all compact, simply connected Riemann surfaces are spheres. So you take the welded thing, you map it to a true sphere, but now the weld is going to be the curve. And so you get the curve back from his fingerprint. This is, it's, a, it's such a marvelous um, uh, <coughs> uh, discovery. So we go backwards from the fingerprint to the shape. And in fact, you get a bijection this way. The diffeomorphism group modulo this three-dimensional group here, which the, f the fingerprint was always undetermined because of that. So you have to divide by the Möbius group. And on the other side, there's some ambiguity. The, the shape is recovered up to translations and scalings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get this, uh, this bijection. The point of this thing I skipped was just to say, that welding turns out to be infinitely easier to do numerically 
this is the full MATLAB code for welding. <laughs> so it's really simple to carry out. OK. Um, all right. So, so this is the basic construction. Now, the, the great thing is that, that you know, we have a group on this side, modulo a very small subgroup. This, of course, is infinite dimensional. This is three dimensional. So, so this is really, um, so really S is almost a group. Uh, so you can do all sorts of things here. First of all, you've got an action of this on this coset space. So this acts on this space. That's why it's homogeneous. It'll be in the metric I'll give in a minute. It's homogeneous. Uh, moreover, you can approximate shapes by words in elementary diffeomorphisms. You have to make kind of a Cayley graph of the whole space. Uh, you can talk about one parameter subgroups. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just such a rich, incredibly rich situation. Here's some one parameter subgroups, I don't know, uh, where you take uh, your diffeomorphism, this is uh, uh, with a parameter C, it gets added here when you uh, compose the fees. Um, and these are just two examples of, of that. Uh, and here's some examples of the, you, you see, you can do, you can compose two mappings. So this fingerprint uh, is simply a, a sort of a rod. Uh, this, this fingerprint is the boomerang. And you compose this with this, but you can also put a rotation in between uh, where you, uh, when you compose them. Uh, and <clears throat> depending on the, uh, the scaling of the situation, you either take the boomerang and you put little protuberances that rotate around the boomerang, you see, as you go. Uh, or here, it's, it's the, the protuberance that dominates the boomerang, and uh, so it's like a, a wrench uh, with a long handle, and the handle rotates around the little wrench type thing. So, uh, so I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of geometry waiting to be done in, in exploring uh, this group composition here that you get in, in simple old-fashioned geometry. Um, but now the metric. The metric is called the Ve peterson metric, and it's most easily expressed uh, in terms of the uh, diffeomorphisms of the circle. Uh, and so what you do is you put a norm on diffeomorphisms of the circle, which kills the, 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 diff the vector fields that are tangent to the Möbius subgroup. And in fact, is invariant under conjugation by the Möbius subgroup. That's, otherwise, it doesn't work. Uh, and how do you get such a thing? In Fourier, uh, suppose I have a, so this is supposed to be a vector field along a circle with coordinate theta. If you, if you make a Fourier expansion of the vector field, it's given by this bizarre coefficient, absolute value of n cubed minus n. So globally, this amounts to taking the a periodic Hilbert transform of the third derivative plus the first derivative. Uh, so you can see that this is, this is essentially a, a sub -left type of inner product. And because there's a third derivative here, and of course that wouldn't be self-adjoint, so you've got to throw in the Hilbert transform, which corresponds to the absolute values here. Um, uh, it has weight three halves. Uh, and that, that's the critical dimension for a sub -left, um, geometry in, uh, in, on a line. Uh, but in any case, um, yeah. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see that, th that this is, uh, gives you a Kähler structure and stuff. But, uh, so I just give you a few instances. Oh, yeah, so the geodesic equation here uh, is, uh, it's kind of like Berger's equation. Uh, if you take the velocity, see, just like I had yesterday, we're going to have a momentum and a velocity. Um, yeah. Uh, so this thing here is the momentum, and we call it u. And so the inner product is the momentum times the velocity integrated. Uh, and, and so you can take the momentum to consist in delta functions. Well, in general, the, the, uh, the, you have this, um, the momentum and the velocity are linked uh, by two dual equations, this being a suitable kernel. And the geodesic equation looks like this. Uh, so it's a little bit like Berger's equation, uh, anyway, involving uh, these uh, derivatives here. So it's fairly simple. And you can let u be a sum of delta functions and easily integrate this. So here are two examples of, uh, of geodesics where, in this case, the circle, we take two 
the <laughs> momentum is only at those points here, one, two, three, four. And those points come together very, very rapidly and it, they sort of pull the shape out and eventually it becomes a, a lens with a singularity at the two ends. And here's a more complicated one that uh, my student, uh, Sergei Kushner, called Donald Duck. He, uh, um, uh, this, a lot of this work is uh, here is due to him. Um, here's a more complicated geodesic uh, where you go from the unit circle to the camel. I don't know why people like it. Well, the camel's obviously because of the, or the dromedary. It's got two humps. Uh, and it's, it's sort of interesting. They, they, the, you see, this is going to be the head. And it, it begins to uh, enlarge as you go through here. And these two things are going to be the two feet um, and the humps here. OK, now one point is the curvature is everywhere negative. There's a very beautiful formula for the curvature. Uh, it, has, it has two terms. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, they're skew symmetric. You see that it's got to be skew in V and W. One way to be what happened here? Should have been mu and nu. Somehow became uh, oh, I see mu and nu. Yeah, right. These are the holomorphic vector fields that you get from uh, V and W by adding the Hilbert transform. So these are holomorphic uh, vector fields now. Uh, and uh, uh, you take this expression now on the disk cross itself with a suitable kernel. Uh, so you have skew symmetric forms. And this negative curvature can be seen, for instance, in the same example I had before of rotating the ellipse. Uh, it goes this way, the geodesic goes like that. So when we rotate this into this, you see that in the middle of that geodesic, it becomes close to a circle. Okay, now I just have a minute or two to say something about, uh, about this more general uh, story here. Uh, so what's, uh, what's interesting uh, about these more general uh, spaces, diff, and uh, I call them Chow quotients because of the algebraic geometry use of the term Chow varieties, the set of sub-manifolds of a fixed type. Uh, you can call the Chow, the Chow manifolds associated to uh, some ambient manifold. Uh, and they have a very, the, the curvature picture, it, it's, you can see uh, clearly uh, there's a big, oh, that's wrong button again. It turns out there's a big negative term uh, in this, uh, which seem, has to do with the kind of mixing effects. Uh, I'll just give you an illustration of what I mean a little bit later. But the, the mixing basically, if things are thoroughly mixed and, and then you mix them in a different way, the best way to go from one mixed state to another is usually to, to go back to the unmixed state. Uh, so that's, that's a negative curvature phenomenon. But there are also some rather complex positive curvature effects. So uh, now Arnold started this picture, uh, but I think, I feel it's still really unclear where it's going. Now there's a lot of machinery here, you see. Uh, we, we, if we have a general manifold, uh, how do we put a metric on, on this at all? Well, what we need is some uh, self-adjoint differential operator, but you want the values, we want to be able to interpret the values as a measure valued one form in order that this inner product uh, makes coordinate free sense. This has to be coordinate free, so the only thing that's dual to a vector field uh, it's got to be a one form, and you've got to be able to integrate it. So it's a measure valued one form. And in that case, the, but the inverse is much easier. The inverse to such an object uh, is given by a, a tensor in this space. Why? Because if I start with a measure valued one form, I can dot it with this tangent component here, then integrate it with the measure, and I wind up with a component which is a tangent vector again. So there, that's the, so, uh, I, I, let me skip over. It's uh, basically the, the fun part of it is, uh, uh, is this general principle. You're dealing with this, the space of these submanifolds, which is infinite dimensional uh, here. So yeah, this is the Chow, Chow variety, the submanifolds. Uh, you're dealing with this infinite dimensional guy. 
the way you're going to carry out your geometry is that you want to lift all the calculations here back to the ambient manifold N in a suitable way. So for instance, you can ask yourself, how am I going to get one forms on B? In a minute, I'll tell you why I want closed one forms on B. And in fact, to M plus one forms, M being the dimension of uh, on N, there's a natural map like this. Uh, if I take an M plus one form restricted to F uh, and then take this, uh, this uh, maps to this, this is a quotient bundle, it turns out, of the restriction of this. So I, and anyway, I'm not going to, uh, let, let me, yeah, kind of add a little more time. This is, I, this is important, though. I, I want to say to differential geometers because as far as I know, this is completely new. I mean, people, of course, since Riemann have been looking at different formulas for Riemann's curvature tensor. What we needed, you see, was a formula for the curvature tensor. Uh, if we want to get the curvature of this space, this is, is a quotient of the diffeomorphism group. Now, when you have a quotient space, uh, if you want to know the length of a vector, you have to lift that vector and look at the vector of least norm. This is a very messy thing to do. Whereas, if you have a covector on a quotient space, the, co the cotangent bundle lifts as a sub-bundle of the cotangent bundle upstairs. So the, co the, the dual metric on the cotangent bundle, just by restriction, gives you the, uh, the, the metric in its, in its dual form. So th that, um, what that means is that what we really need is a formula for, for curvature, which involves as much as possible the dual metric and not the metric. And so the following turns out to be true, and Mario is, uh, loves to call it the Mario's formula. Um, so it comes like this. You now have to take closed one forms, and uh, we're on a, a Riemannian manifold, finite dimensional if you like. Uh, and the, the dual to those closed one forms with the metric would be two vector fields. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, you want these uh, to be uh, this to be orthonormal. So the dual one forms, the one forms are going to be orthonormal. Okay, then the formula is this uh, for the sectional curvature in the two plane given by this. So you have inner products in the dual metric. This is the co the, the u's are, are one form, so this is the length of one, of one form, so the inner product to which you apply these vector fields. And here, uh, you take the inner product, uh, you take d of that function, and take its length in the, in the dual metric. So all of these involve only the dual metric. And then one term here, which is like O'Neill's formula, involving the, these vector fields in the original manifold. You see, it's, it's quite impossible to get these forms closed and these guys to have Lie bracket zero simultaneously. Uh, um, except, of course, in very simple cases. So this formula is, in a certain sense, the absolute form of O'Neill's formula. If you take this on a, when you have a submersion and subtract the two, you get O'Neill's formula. Uh, so, this, so this was a tremendous breakthrough uh, to be able to do this. And unfortunately, uh, sorry about this, I took this out of the paper. The formula... <laughs> uh, like the formula that Arnold gives in his original paper, uh, the, the sectional curvature seems to have four terms. But they, I think they're all interpretable. This is this mixing term that I'm going to talk about in a second. So rather than talk, since I'm out of time now, uh, I'm going to just give you some examples. So uh, we're going to go back to the finite dimensional case of landmark spaces. So this is what I mean by mixing. Suppo so what's happening here is there is a single point which has momentum and which is moving here. But, uh, and so this is what happens to all the other points around it which are simply moving passively. Now, if I, if I move that point this way instead, you see, you've got all these things crowded together here uh, that, that uh, if I moved it this way would not be crowded together. So by far the simplest way to go from this deformed configuration to the one down here where it moved in the other direction is really to just go backwards, near to the origin. And so the, um, that's, that's really strong negative curvature. Now, there are two ways in landmark space uh, that you can get positive curvature that I know about. 
And in fact, if you only have two points with momentum, these are the only two ways. Uh, so one is only in three dimensions and higher. If I have two landmark points and they're going to switch positions, uh, this B goes from here to here, uh, and A uh, goes. So yeah, if they're going to, I want B, one to go from here to here, and uh, the other to go backwards. So they obviously have to go around each other because uh, to go through each other is hugely energetic. So they can go around each other in this plane, that moving that way and that moving that way, or in this plane, that moving that way and that moving that way, or that way. So, so you have the ambiguous plane. So you've got a positive sectional curvature there. Uh, the other way positive curvature arises is that if two points are going to move parallel to each other, uh, you often get two geodesics if the lengths are right. Uh, one situation, they ignore each other. The other, they decide, what the hell, let's uh, get on the same bus. And so they move towards each other and then away from each other. And so you get, you get a conjugate point uh, when this pair is moved to that pair. So there's two very simple reasons why you get positive curvature. Uh, I don't know how to state a conjecture, but the question really is, uh, this is the terms involved in the curvature. And, um, but um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think there should be some theorem that says the curvature is sort of limited uh, in all of these child manifolds uh, and landmark space. But, uh, and that might conceivably shed some light on things like the Euler equation um, existence problem. Uh, okay, so let me just finish with a final point. Uh, so my general philosophy in this is uh, that th there's a, a collection of, of, there's a point of view which uh, I feel very strongly was Thurston's point of view in a lot of the stuff he did, uh, which is uh, to ask yourself what the geodesic geometry of some space like diff or B what that geodesic geometry looks like, and to try to make the effects of curvature as explicit as possible. So you can do numerical simulations and look for theorems which reflect the geometry both of diff or m, uh, which, uh, which reflect the geometry of diff and the nature of flows in n. So you see, a, a geodesic in diff is really just a flow in n. And as much as you can find a di dictionary between them, uh, you get some insight. And likewise, uh, a geodesic in B is like a warping of a submanifold. So I, I see this as an exploratory project, which, which one hopes will bring out new perspectives. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful lecture. And I want to open the floor for questions and comments. Please. Yeah. Well, one question actually re regarding the, the welding with the complex, yes. with the schwarz christoffel So if I have this sort of a piecewise construction of the function, right, and then I do the welding, and then I decide to numerically compute the derivative across the region that was welded, right? If I use Driscoll's code and so on, what is the regularity I can get by numerically doing yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you certainly, you've got, you got problems. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think to get derivatives and all, the, um, uh, this other method of, um, uh, oh God, is better. Yeah, Marshall says the zipper algorithm. This, is, this, this represents the Riemann mapping as a composition of nice, really nice maps. And uh, so in many ways that's... So how smooth is this welding? I mean, it... uh, you mean if you, re well, if you really have polygons, you see, I think those polygons are, are going to be at infinite distance. In, in the, you see, so what's happened is that, that classically people talked about a certain universal Teichmuller space which was complete in the Teichmuller metric. And this includes rather jagged curves. Now, there's inside there, uh, there is a Hilbert submanifold uh, where the curves are essentially sublifts regularity three halves. Uh, and no one knows exactly how to describe those curves, but that's intuitively what they are. And th those are the curves which are, will be at you know, a finite distance from the unit circle and so on. 
And so I don't think polygons are in the space. Well, okay. We, all, we can talk later. My question was a little bit on the direction. If I would say a potential flow and I use a mapping above, a mapping below, ah. can I sort of glue the two regions? For example, in water waves, we have internal waves. So I could have right. a you see, so it was a little bit in this direction. Could I glue things? Well, the gluing, you see, I mean, this is the, the miracle welding. complex analysis, uh, that if you have something which we simply continuously glue two things which are remount services to each other, the, the, the construction has complex structure across that gluing. It's, it's sort of, it just requires continuity. Right, but then I was asking and numerically if you had any, any experience from this, knowing how much you can recover from that using Driscoll's toolbox. I see. See, that's uh, the question. So I maybe express myself appropriately, but it's through this, how much you can recover from the, from the regularity. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, you mean, yeah, yeah, this direction, yeah, so I'm, you know. No, so I maybe express myself. I haven't looked at that. Okay, well, thank you. More comments, <clears throat> questions? Yes. Yes, I have a like question. Ask, uh, what? All the time. Uh, yes, I'm a global uh, question. Uh, question asker. Asker. Uh, so the question is regarding the definition of uh, an infinite manifold, because in finite dimensional yes. manifold, you can go back to R n, but I w it wasn't clear to me what you. You, you got some topological vector space. You yeah. need to. I mean, it can be. Uh, you you choose. You choose your, uh, it's not Rn, you, you, you choose a, uh, a topological vector space in which your coordinates are going to lie. So it depends, so when, when you change this, uh, so when you call a Hilbert manifold, you will go to a Hilbert. Exactly, uh, so then the coordinates are in a Hilbert space. Yes. Yeah, they should be op open sets in a Hilbert space. Uh, actually, uh, my collaborator and his students uh, have, have begun looking at two-dimensional surfaces, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the formulas get <laughs> a little bit out of control, and um, the, the numerical simulations are much tougher, but they have definitely been making progress. Can you define area? You mean as a functional on the space? On the two-dimensional surfaces? Sure. Dimensional. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, a point, it's, it's a function on the space. So there's an, oh, you mean area in the space? I take a two-dimensional surface in this infinite-dimensional space. Two oh, oh, okay. Ah, no, I didn't understand that. Well, I guess you'd probably, I haven't done that, no, but I, you, you'd obviously <laughs> triangulate and subdivide and uh, no. take the usual formula. But, uh, yeah, that, that's very interesting, yeah. So one should try to do that. Yeah. Well, it depends on how nice your service is. <laughs> well, even if it's seen infinity, they can still be there in all three, and you triangulate it in a funny way, you get an infinite answer when you take the sum of the area. Right, so I mean, you want your triangles to have diameters going to zero. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, you're right. Ah, okay, that's a good point. So you, uh, you, that sounds like a marvelous PhD thesis. <laughs>